Chairman, and good evening, my dear respected friends. Yes, we believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming to make drastic changes to the world as we know it. So what is it, my dear friends, that needs to be changed? Well, we could spend all night talking about those things, and we're going to look at some examples in a few moments. But as a very brief overview, if we consider the world in which we live today, what do we find? We find cases of civil unrest among the nations. And certainly, if we consider places such as the Middle East and Egypt, very topical, Syria, very topical, Africa, very topical, and numerous cases, we find frightening build-up of both conventional and uh, nuclear armaments. We find that the financial storm is still bubbling and brewing along, as we discussed last, eve uh, last Sunday evening. Our speaker went into those details very nicely. We see the continued breakdown of moral standards in society. And related to that, of course, we find the family unit is continuing to experience pressure. We find widespread use of drugs and so on in society. We find that the environment continues to suffer the effects of pollution and land clearing and so on. We find there's increasing poverty throughout the world, not only in undeveloped countries, let's not think that they, it only exists there as, we, as we'll see a bit later on, uh, certainly in our own country as well. And we find materialism, greed, ambition, and the pursuit of pleasures everywhere around us. And that is very typical of human behaviour. And that, my dear friends, is essentially the problem. So we live in a world, having described a few things there, we live in a world which is straining under the weight of the burden of all those things that man has developed himself. And on a world scale, there are many, many threats to human safety and peace and mere existence for some people. So clearly we live in a world which needs changing, dramatic changes. And so we want to consider briefly a few examples. Yeah, I hope you all brought your binoculars tonight because that's a little smaller than I had hoped for it to be. We might need a light out there perhaps so that uh, we can see what's going on. Please. All right, so we've got here a headline. Civil unrest leads Aon to downgrade 37 countries on political risk map. Now, this is an article which I found from the Insurance Journal. And what it's all about, my dear friends, is that this particular crowd, Aon, Risk Solutions, they look at the entire world and they assess every country in the world. Is that any better? They assess every country in the world on the basis of insurance that multinational companies require so that they are able to protect their employees their physical assets, and ultimately their profitability worldwide. So that's the basis for this. So just a few little bits out of uh, this particular article here. Uh, they are a global risk management business, and they've issued the latest, this is 2013, so it's not that old, the latest political risk map, which gauges the level of risk in more than 200 countries. Principal reason for downgrades. Now, downgrades is actually an anomaly because it's actually an upgrade. It's the reverse of what you think it is. Uh, so, principal reason for downgrades is directly linked to the continued effects of the global economic crisis. So, that clearly hasn't gone away. As austerity measures and spending cuts 
to hold civil unrest, riots and strikes were witnessed. It's all related, my dear friends. We can't separate these things. Terrorism has not disappeared as a major threat. 46% of all countries assessed possess the risk of a terrorism incident. Nearly half the world, or well, nearly half of the 200 countries anyway. The political risk map acts as a gauge for the intensity of the threat to, of political violence and assesses three key areas. Terrorism and sabotage, strikes, they don't want those, riots, commotion and malicious damage to property, they don't want that either, political insurrection, revolution, rebellion, mutiny, coup d'etat, war and civil war. A nice combination of things, I'm sure you would agree. And it continues, just briefly, for the first time since the map's inception, we have recorded significant negative ratings in Western Europe that reflect civil disorder in economies traditionally seen as stable. And that's the point we want to, we want to make there, my dear friends. Things that were once considered stable, stable are no longer. With further austerity measures still to be imposed, and the Eurozone crisis only in remission, economic and social degradation are likely to be important drivers of future unrest. And the final point that we've gleaned out is the Arab Spring features heavily in our assessments, both for its contribution to civil unrest and also as post-uprising states fail to guarantee local and regional security. Weapons proliferation and unchecked growth of radical groups in Libya, Yemen and the Sinai Peninsula are of particular concern. There's a lot in that, isn't there? But that's the world that we're in and these people are doing these risk assessment for us. Now, a couple of these maps here we have the political risk map. So this one here is a zero to six rating. And the darker the colour, uh, the greater the risk. So it goes, well obviously we've got the dark ones there listed down the side there. We start over in South America there with Venezuela and then into Africa. And you can see those for yourself there. And then up into the Middle East and then across finally to our friends in North Korea. All very, very political, unstable regimes, my dear friends. And then we have a look at the terrorism risk map, and that is slightly different. It's a lot more widespread in the darker colours there. That's a zero to five rating, and of course you can see now serious chunks of Africa and the Middle East are listed all there for you, they have extremely high risk of a terrorism incident occurring. So who wants to go there? All right, so, so much for that. Uh, now, if we move on to perhaps our next point there, let's just consider the basic shortages of essential things that you and I would consider in life to be absolutely essential and we take for granted. Somalia, it's everywhere, but let's have a look at this. Somalia, water shortage sparks deadly street post in Somalia. This is just the other day on the 28th of December. Severe water shortage is due to a lack of distribution by water trucks. Hundreds of protesters have set tyres on fire blocked roads with thorn bushes, clashed with police who fired live ammunition at them. So that's helpful. Here we go. The Interior Minister, the Interior Minister said, this is his quote, Somalis, a committee which would have representatives from the Interior Ministry, Finance Ministry and water carrier trucks will assess the magnitude of the complaints and the water scarcity. 
unquote. I would suggest, my dear friends, that the nature of the complaint is fairly obvious and uh, that the, uh, there's a simple solution to that particular one, get the water trucks out and moving. We take these sorts of things for granted, but these people don't have such a luxury. Let's take another brief example. In Liberia, this is 2013, 70% of public primary schools lack toilet facilities. We take these things for absolute granted, my dear friends. Then we come closer to home. Child poverty in Australia. UNICEF and community groups called to prioritise action, November 12, 2013. Even in times of economic wellbeing, nearly 600,000 or 17.3 per cent of Australia's children continue to live in poverty. So, so much for what Mr Hawke said uh, a few years ago. Uh, this is an updated report released by the Australian Council of Social Services, which is ACOS. It is ironic that while internationally the rate of child poverty is decreasing, a wealthy nation like Australia is slipping, according to UNICEF. And ACOS CEO, Dr Cassandra Goldie, pointed out that the figure released by the Council shows a 15% increase since 2001. So we're not getting any better, we're going backwards. And that, my dear friends, is in our own backyard, in the lucky country of course, as it's been known over the years. The lucky country. All right, then we come to such matters as the disintegration of the family unit. And in a recent survey on divorcing parents, there's some of these interesting facts have been revealed. 5% of children turn to alcohol. 11% of children deliberately harm themselves. 6% considered suicide, 2% attempted suicide, nearly 9% thought that the divorce meant that parents didn't love them and had let them down. Very, very sad statistics, I'm sure you would agree. The findings have been released ahead of January 6. I don't know if you've come across this previously which has been dubbed D-Day as the day that many couples struggling after a stressful family Christmas, stressful family Christmas, finally filed for divorce. That's it, January 6th, that's the day to do it. D-Day, divorce day. Very, very sad. It estimates that one in three children see their parents separate before the age of 16. That's the world that we live in, my dear friends. Now those experiences there should be totally foreign to the teaching of the scriptures that we're to here to consider this evening. But they reflect the breakdown in our society. And they're the very things that the Lord Jesus Christ's return will solve. Briefly, we look at such things as so social inequity and dramatic increases in taxes. Dramatic increases in taxes as a grab to solve their financial problems across the world. In 2012, the French socialist president promised to introduce a 75% tax rate on incomes above 1 million euros. This proposal was designed to get the country back on its feet by reducing the budget deficit from 4.5% of, of the national GDP to 3%. The tax would have affected 
approximately 30,000 workers out of a population of 65 million. In last Tuesday's West Australian, the following report was made regarding this. French President Francois Hollande has finally got his super tax on high incomes. Mr Hollande uh, originally wanted a 75% tax, but the Constitutional Council threw it out, threw out the tax as unfair. He rewrote the laws for his 2014 budget to be a 50% tax paid by the employer without affecting the employee's earnings. And related to this, I couldn't help but have a chuckle. Uh, the French football club, this is the heading, French football clubs to strike over government 75% super tax plan. They're an uproar. They cancelled, they, they went on strike. There was no matches on the 29th of November to the 2nd of December. That was their strike. And then there's a statement from an official of the LFP, and he said, this day football in danger altogether. You know, my dear friends, we live in a mad, crazy world. In some parts of the world there's no water, as we've seen, there's no food, there's no basics of life, and yet these jokers who are running around on a football field are up in arms about their government introducing a tax that they don't like the look of. It's a very, very bitter and twisted world in which we live, is it not? And our final example is that of terrorism. Terrorism the world over, but of course it's very, very topical at the moment, is it not, in Russia. And so we have a little statement there, more than a dozen confirmed dead and 27 injured after a female suicide bomber attacked a railway station in Volograd in southern Russia. Uh, that was on Monday the 30th. That's just less than a week ago, of December 2013. This happened a day after a deadly suicide bombing at the city's main train station where at least 17 people died. And that was on, uh, that was the next day, of course, on the Big pardon, that was the previous day on the Sunday the 29th. Prior to that, in October, it's all going off over there. Prior to that, in October, there was a woman who detonated a vessel of explosives aboard a bus, a bus in uh, Volograd, killing herself and six others. The bombing was linked to an Islamic related group, which is not, of course, unheard of, growing by the day. And of course, that is just a snapshot, my dear friends, of the violent, godless world in which we live. And of course, the Russians are very, very nervous because of their Winter Olympics. But yesterday, the US Defence uh, Secretary, Chuck Hagel, has been on the phone to his counterpart in Russia and they not only condemned what's happened, of course, but they have uh, certainly offered to provide extra security to assist with the running of the Olympic Games. So, my dear friends, as a very brief snapshot, we live in a world which is literally a train wreck, is it not? And so, with those few examples, we turn our attention to the Word of God because the only hope for this world is the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Christadelphians believe that and we believe that it will be soon. It's not a widely held view in the community or in the churches around us, but we hope to, to see this evening that it is the teaching of the Bible. There are, of course, numerous reasons, and we've looked at them on the screen there already briefly this evening, numerous reasons as to why the Lord Jesus Christ 
should return. But the main reason, my dear friends, is to fulfil God's purpose. That is the main reason. Yes, there is a God. He's aware of what's happening on the earth and he will act soon by sending his son back to this earth to change this world forever. It will never be the same again. I can guarantee you that. So, we'll get you to come with us then, if you would, across to the prophecy of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 25. Let's have a look at some of the words of the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah 25 and commencing at verse 30. Just a couple of lines down from the start of that verse. The Lord shall roar from on high and utter his voice from his holy habitation. He shall mightily roar upon his Habitation, he shall give a shout as they that tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. This is the judgments of God upon this mess that we're looking at on the screen here tonight. A noise shall come even to the ends of the earth, for the Lord hath a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh, he will give them that are wicked to the sword, saith the Lord. Verse 32, thus saith the Lord of hosts, behold, evil shall go forth from nation to nation, and the great whirlwind shall be raised up from the coasts of the earth. And the slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth. This earth seen nothing like it before. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered nor buried, they shall be dung upon the ground. So, my dear friends, one of the reasons why God is going to send the Lord Jesus Christ back to this earth is because, that phrase in verse 31 there, the Lord hath a controversy with the nations. He's got a few things to sort out with the nations of this world. And he will, and it's described very, very graphically in verse 33 there, as we've read. So, why is God, a, God going to send his judgments upon the earth? Let's come across to a, a little uh, prophet, the prophet Joel. It's just before the prophet Amos, if you can find Amos. In the minor prophets there, Hosea, Joel, Amos. What is it? What's this con controversy all about? Well, we've suggested it's because of the things that we've looked at on the screen there, and that's absolutely correct. Joel chapter 3, which is a, a chapter very worthy of consideration for a longer period of time, has there in verse 13, this is uh, God speaking through Joel, he says... Put in the sickle. That's how they used to harvest their crops, with a sickle. For the harvest is ripe. It's ready to go. It's ready to be gathered into the barn. Come, get you down, for the press is full, the fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. There it is. That's the reason that God has a controversy with the nations of this earth. The analogy here is the, is the, harvest, is the ripening of a, of a crop for harvest. But it's the peoples of this earth. Their wickedness is great. And that is what we have seen already this evening. Their wickedness in, is great. The Apostle John in 1st of John chapter 5 and verse 19, we won't turn there, tells us that the whole world lieth in wickedness. That's what scripture says. Just imagine what the Apostle John would write today, if he was writing today. Now, we want to have a look at just three brief quotes that confirm for us that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return to this earth. And I ask you to 
to uh, turn with us to Acts chapter 1, the book of Acts and chapter 1, where we have a very, very simple and a very clear description of the Lord Jesus Christ leaving this earth. Acts chapter 1, commencing at verse 9. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. So he went up, and he was engulfed within a cloud. Verse 10, and while they looked steadfastly, so this is the, this is the apostles, toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, I would suggest to you that they were angelic beings, which also said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner, as ye have seen him go into heaven. Now I want to read verse 12, because I want you to remember the content of it. Then returned they, the apostles, unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, what we would call today the Mount of Olives, same thing, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day journey. I want you to remember the detail of verse 12. So there we have in verses 9, 10 and 11 a very simple explanation, a very simple description of how the Lord Jesus Christ departed this earth and the promise that he will return in the same way. Come across with me to, in the same book, Acts chapter 17 and verse 31. This is, the, this is uh, God speaking through the apostle. Uh, in verse 30, he says, But now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day. Now, every phrase in this verse is very important. We don't really have time to spend too much time here. A day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man, the Lord Jesus Christ, whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men. That's you and I, friends. All men across this whole world in that he hath raised him from the dead. The Lord Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. We've seen that he's ascended into heaven, and that's where we believe he currently is. And now if we go to the prophecy of Zechariah, almost at the very end of the Old Testament, Zechariah chapter 14, we have some wonderful verses in this chapter, which relate to our topic as well, verses 1 to 4. But in particular, we're just going to have a look at verse 4, because this speaks about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to this earth. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. There it is. We saw that, did we not, in Acts chapter 1 and verse 12. In other words, his feet are going to land in exactly the same location as where they left. And then the verse goes on to describe the shaking of the earth, the changes to the topography which are going to occur when Almighty God sends an enormous earthquake upon this earth the likes of which this earth has never seen. And we're going to drop our eyes down to verse 9. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord and his name one. So we've got the return of the Lord Jesus Christ upon the earth there in verse 4. And we've got the key reason being the fulfilment of God's purpose, which we see there in verse 9 of that same chapter. And so we believe, brethren, we believe, my dear friends, that the uh, Bible is very clear in its teaching, very consistent in its teaching, that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return to this earth 
and that the second coming as the Lord Jesus of the Lord Jesus Christ is sure and guaranteed. Now we want to consider, of course, our title says that there's going to be some changes. We want to consider what some of those changes are likely to be. And so uh, we've got a, a small number of uh, passages that we would like to consider, but primarily we've read together this evening Psalm 72, which is a wonderful, wonderful psalm, which gives us a very descriptive picture of life on the earth as it will be, in absolute and total contrast to what we've considered on the screen here this evening. These are the much needed changes that God has promised and foretold. This is a new system of government which will be established under the wise rule of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so verse 1 says, Give the king thy judgments, O God, and thy righteousness unto the king's son. Now, the difference between today and the future age is that the rulers of today, of course, they seek their own power. They are power hungry. But in the future, of course, the difference is that it's going to be based on righteousness. Now, that's a word which we don't hear very often uh, these days. People that you work with, I don't know if they ever talk about righteousness. I don't think so. Uh, what does it actually mean? <clears throat> well, if you ask a person in the street, I'm not sure whether they'd be able to give you an answer. But you see, what it does is it sums up God's character. He is righteous in his character. It means rightness, quite simply, rightness, or justice. That's what it means. And that will be the basis for everything in the future age. And so we have similar ideas in verse 2. He shall judge thy people with righteousness and thy poor with judgment. You see, the difference between today and the promised future age, my dear friends, is that in the future there will be fair, right, just authority being administered over the entire world, the entire earth. What a change that will be from today. Major change. Verse Four. Let's have a look at that. He shall judge the poor of the people. He shall save the children of the needy and shall break in pieces the oppressor, the children of the needy. They'll be saved. They're all over the world at the moment, my dear friends, in every continent and country of this world. And they're the result of man's own doing, unfortunately. And the same hope is held out to them as it is to us. Verse 6. Verse 6. A lovely verse which we never tire of reading. He shall come down like rain upon the mown grass as showers that water the earth. So we have here some very poetic... It's uh, sort of lost a little bit there, isn't it? It's a uh, very poetic language to describe the help that will come from the Lord Jesus Christ that is showers upon the mown grass, well may, may not be mown grass but on the grass the help my dear friends which is going to come from the Lord Jesus Christ just as the rain helps the earth, it helps the grass it refreshes the earth so the Lord Jesus Christ will provide relief, he'll provide help for all the people of the earth. He'll show compassion and care for those that currently don't experience it. What a wonderful thought that is. Verse 7. In his days shall the righteous, there it is again, flourish and abundance of peace so long as the moon endureth. 
It's a very, very different situation. Today, the wicked seem to perish, do they not? Uh, to, seem to flourish, I should say. Uh, the wicked seem to flourish, uh, and the uh, the righteous seem to perish. But it's a very, very different world to consider, is it not? And then verses eight and nine, we're told that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to have a dominion. He will, he shall have dominion. Verse eight, also from sea to sea and from river. The river unto the ends of the earth, they that dwell in the wilderness shall bow before him, and his enemies shall lick the dust. If there are any, if there are any enemies of the Lord Jesus Christ, they're going to get their just desserts. They are going to lick the dust. It's very, very clear. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to have the authority and he's going to command respect from all peoples of the earth. And conflict, I mean, everything just about that we saw in the first part of our comments this evening is based on conflict, isn't it? Conflict about everything. That's going to be replaced with harmony. What a pleasant, pleasant thing that will be. In verse 14, he shall redeem their soul from deceit and violence and precious shall their blood be in his sight. So that's talking about the poor and needy of the previous verse. They're going to be redeemed. They're going to be given salvation. The, one of the other translations says this, the New American Standard Bible says this, he will rescue their life. That's what he's going to do. He will rescue their life from oppression and violence. And their blood will be precious in his sight. What is it today? Spill it on the ground. It doesn't matter. So that's going to be the amazing work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who cares today? They don't care whether the water, truck, the water trucks get around and provide people with water. Somalia, it doesn't matter. Things are going to happen my dear friends, when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. And we want to be part of those things. Verse 16. There shall be an handful. It should be better translated an abundance. There shall be an abundance of corn in the earth upon the top of the mountains. The fruit thereof shall shake like Lebanon, and they of the city shall flourish like grass of the earth. 57% of the current world population are malnourished. 57%. And 6 million children die annually through malnutrition. They're scary figures, my dear friends. But that's the world that we live in. It's all going to change dramatically when the Lord Jesus Christ establishes his kingdom on this earth, everyone will have the basic provisions of life. And verse 17, his name <clears throat> shall endure forever. His name shall be continued as long as the sun. The sun doesn't go away, does it? And men shall be blessed in him, and all nations shall call him blessed. These are the answers, my dear friends, to the world's problems that we see around us today. Food supply, healthy living conditions, housing, employment, safety and protection. All the things that the major, many of the major governments of the, and the peoples of the world today can't provide and don't experience will be provided by the Lord Jesus Christ. So, particular psalm comes towards its conclusion. Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only doeth wondrous things, and blessed be his glorious name forever. And let the whole earth be filled with his glory. These things are still to be fulfilled in the future, clearly, because those things don't exist as we stand or sit here today. My dear friends, I'm sure you would agree. But the time is coming when they will be a reality. 
when the God of Israel <coughs> completes his plan and purpose with this earth. You see, God has provided with us with a hope and he's provided us with the hope of Israel. Come back with me to the book of Acts, to Acts chapter 28 and verse 20 where we have the words of the Apostle Paul. And he's talking about the hope that we've been considering this evening, the hope of the establishment of God's kingdom upon this earth, Acts chapter 28. And he says in verse 20 of Acts chapter 28, For this cause, therefore, have I called for you to see you and to speak with you, because that for the hope of Israel... I am bound with his chain. So he's sitting there in Rome in chains and he's quite happy to share with those who are there with him that he's bound in chains for the hope of Israel. And of course what that means is, and it's dealt with on many, many occasions from this platform, is it relates to the hope made to the fathers of Israel, the promises made to the fathers of Israel. That's what he's talking about. So he was still waiting for the fulfilment of those promises. And so are we, my dear friends. We too are waiting for the fulfilment of the promises made to the fathers of Israel, which is the hope of Israel. And so we've turned away from Psalm 72, but... The last, uh, second last verse there in uh, verse 19 of Psalm 72 describes for us the total transformation of this world. A world which is going to know peace and happiness and tranquility. Where it says, and let the whole earth be filled with his glory. God's glory, there's very little evidence other than creation itself in this world of God's glory today. But as we said at the outset, it is God's purpose that it might be fulfilled. And his purpose is to fill this earth with his glory, as we have in such passages as Numbers chapter 14 and verse 21. Now, my dear friends, we have a day of opportunity today. Come with, come with me, if you will, to Isaiah 55 and 56. We have a day of opportunity, and it's wise if we take that opportunity, considering that we've looked at a number of different aspects this evening, which certainly confirm for us that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return. And so if we looked at, firstly, at Isaiah 55 and verse 6, Isaiah says... <coughs> Excuse me, verse 6, he says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Today is our opportunity to seek and to call upon the God of heaven and earth. Those words there, my dear friends, indicate to us that there is a time coming when we will not be able to do that. So we must take the opportunity now, and <clears throat> excuse me, in the next chapter in Isaiah 56, uh, it would be nice to look at verses 1 and 2, but we'll look just at verse 5. Even unto them, these are the ones mentioned in verses 1 and 2, who keep the judgments of God and do God's justice. To them, he says in verse 5, even unto them will I give in mine house and within my walls a place and a name better than of sons and of daughters. I will give them an everlasting name. They shall not be cut off. We have the hope, my dear friends, of being given a place and a name, an everlasting name, by Almighty God. 
But verse 6 does identify for us that there are responsibilities. It says there in verse 6, Also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him, to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it, and taketh hold of my covenant. They are our responsibilities today to join ourselves to the Lord, to serve him, to love the name of the Lord, to take hold on God's covenant. And verse 7, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful. Not like today. Joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar, for mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. That is a description of what will take place, we believe, in the artist's impression which you see on the screen there in front of you now. That is what we will see take place at that time. That is a very, very different world and a very, very different hope to which we see around us today, is it not? And so what must we do then? Firstly, we must accept that the Bible is the word of God, that it is true, that it is reliable, that we can put our confidence and our trust and our faith in it, and that it's able to guide us unto salvation and ultimately to God's kingdom. Secondly, it takes a little more than just accepting the Bible. We must believe. And if you'll come with me back to the book of Acts, chapter 8. Belief is a firm conviction, my dear friends, which we see here described for us in Acts chapter 8 and verse 12. But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptised, both men and women. And of course, there's the second and third aspects which we really need to focus on. They believed and then they acted and they were baptised. And their baptism was recognition of their belief. And so we're told these things again in Acts chapter 3. Come back with me just a few pages to Acts chapter 3 where we see that it's emphasised again. Repent, verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted. We have to turn ourselves around and go in the opposite direction. Why? That your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And there it is, my dear friends. Our sins we pray will be blotted out or wiped away if we repent and we are converted. And as that verse there describes, a time of refreshing, isn't that what this world is crying out for? A time of refreshing? I believe absolutely as you would that it is. And so... Verse 20, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. And there it is again. That is the hope of the Bible. And so we can face the future with absolute assurance, my dear friends. Come with me to our last passage, which is Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2.
We can have absolute confidence in the teaching of the Bible regarding the matters of the future. We, can, we have two choices, my dear friends. We can carry on doing what we might be currently doing. We can choose to disobey God's word. That's one choice. And in that case, verse 8 of Romans chapter 2 says, But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, that's the reward there. But on a far more positive note, the verse before that describes the glorious hope, which is the hope of the Bible, to them who by patient continuance or perseverance in well-doing seek for glory and honour and immortality, eternal life. There it is, my dear friends. May it be that you, along with myself, might take the time and opportunity which we have to search out the Bible regarding this message, regarding the message of the hope of Israel, that we might be part of that glorious kingdom when it is established upon this earth in the near future.